But a vigorous discussion is also probably pretty good. So what I want to start with is everybody, uh, when we get to run, uh, we'll do Foundry last, just because that's probably like the most, ex like furthest away from the core curriculum that you're going to be reviewing with Alchemy, because Alchemy uses hard hat. So we'll do that. And then if we get to Foundry, we'll do that. And if anyone wants to check out at any time, this is you know, obviously completely optional. You can go out and work and do whatever you need. And if we don't get to Foundry, we can do it another time, right? Um, so uh, in saying that, you need Rust installed on your machine. That's the last time I'm going to say that. <laughs> I think I caught everybody. All right. So what I want to do is I want to start with Remix. I want to build an authorizer contract, which is very similar to the owner contract. And we're going to test that contract out in Hardhat and then test that contract out in Foundry Forge. Do we need separate project directories for our hard hat and foundry? Or yeah, great question. So the thing I don't like about these testing frameworks is they're kind of like moving towards the SDK model where they're like, make your new project yeah. with hard hat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to write the contract in Remix. And there are some disadvantages for doing that. But we're going to write it in Remix. And then we're going to just copy and paste. So we're going to spin up a new hard hat and we're going to spin up a new uh, forge project. And we're going to just copy and paste. Right? But what I want to do is I want to give us a little bit of an idea of just how to write. I mean, next week is going to be all Solidity practice, so we're going to be writing tons of Solidity code. So I figure we can just get a start there. Um, if you're not familiar uh, with this browser IDE, it's called remix.ethereum.org. They've been supporting, the Ethereum Foundation has been supporting this for a long time. This is where I do a lot of my sketching because you can do, you, you have access to a local environment here, but you can also hook up your uh, MetaMask and work with test nets, and you can also do uh, you know production deployments as well. Um, I will say the tricky thing is you don't want to copy and paste over changes from Remix where you're sketching to like a production repo because you want <laughs> copy and pasting will lead to errors inevitably, and you kind of want the thing that you're running unit tests to be your like. One source of truth is like here's the repo here's the repository. Whatever gets deployed from this depository or repository is what's you know on chain. I, you know I'm not copying and pasting over. I've done that copying and pasting over, and I'm always like, did I is that one space? Did I use one space there? Or to, you know it's it can introduce some bugs. So you don't want that. But I do like this interface, and it's gotten a lot better over the years for sketching. So I do a lot of sketches here. Um, and I was working with the governance, which you'll get to, and the delegate call stuff. Um, and Adrian, I was working on that games thing in here. I was mm -hmm. trying to like um, uh, do a prototype in here before I used hard hat. Uh, so I figured it out here first. Um, but so anyway, this is you know kind of very similar. I'm going to make a new folder, and I'll call it. Uh, let's just see, off or no off. What is it? Off, off or zer? Yeah. Authorizer, right? And then um, we're just going to put a new contract in there, and we're going to write it together because because um, you guys are going to get really familiar with doing this, right? So it's uh, I just made a new um, contract. Authorizer dot soul. What's the first line? Uh, the license. Right. So you don't have to put that in there, but it will complain if you don't. And it's good to I, the. Uh, uh, and I would offer, so it's a little small on mine. I know it's good there, but it sucks here. Um, I would offer, there's more than just MIT licensing. <laughs> that's what everyone, that's the default. Uh, so I like to use uh, GPL3. Uh, and then what's the next one? Pragma, right? What do we, what's, what do we do? Pragma. Solidity. Solidity. You can do that up here if you want. All right, do we know the differences yet? I'm gonna use uh, less than or equal to just to throw it up there. Zero point eight oh, point. What do we want? So latest is eighteen. Yeah, eighteen. Uh, do we get? Uh, do we no. have access to eighteen? I don't even know. Uh, let's let's, let's, let's do. Uh, so this has compilers in it as well. Let's see where is our. Where are you adding just under contracts? Uh, we do have eighteen. If you want to use eighteen, um, I uh, so in this. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. Also, also it's going to be boring for a lot of it, but <laughs> if we're we're eventually going to get there. Uh, but I'd like to get the whole group there. Um, so I'm I'm pretty sure we're just going to be focusing on the middle. If you're on the, I don't understand side. I'll try and catch you up. If you're on the I'm so bored side, we're trying to get the group forward. Um, so in this particular one, you know, it's very similar to kind of maybe um, 
VS Code where here's the files. So in the workspaces, I just you can throw it anywhere. It's, we're just going to sketch it out. So I, I just made a new folder called Authorizer under Bootcamp, whereas I've been doing some sketching. And I made this contract called authorizer.soul. Uh, so let's use 18. I don't know if that's going to blow anything up for us. Uh, what do we need to end our lines with in Solidity? Semicolon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, what's my next line here? Contract. Um, Authorizer. Oh, nice. Spelled the same, also with a capital. Is it with an O or an E? I okay. see. This is really great. Yeah, it's a great discussion. Uh, it's E, but I always <laughs> think it's O. Like I always want to put an O in there. Yeah. And then I go to Google and like okay. uh, authorizer, authorizer. Okay, you can make it an O. Make it an O. So make it an O in yours. <laughs> okay. Is this inheriting? We haven't gone through inheritance, but if I was pulling any contracts in, I might be able to like say this is owner, right? Mm -hmm. And then it would be uh, I'm pulling all the owner code, but this is actually going to replace what owner is. So this is going to be an authorizer. So it's going to basically be the same thing that owner does. Does everyone is everyone familiar with what the owner contract does? This is message sender. Yeah, there's no like yeah message sender TXR version whatever that it assigns that to a global or a variable right. Right, and so why do we do that? Like every contract is going to have these things. So you can keep track of who deployed it. And then, um, so like admin rights. why would you want it? admin rights? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the person who deployed it gets like special privileges, right? And sometimes, even though everything's public, sometimes we want to only allow certain people to. Right. Do things. It's the same with like no. any type of. What's that? Sometimes you want uh, to Rug. have special privileges like rugging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not an attorney, but I would not advocate <laughs> uh, Right. This is going to be very similar to. Software development. So, like, sometimes you want uh, admin privileges that users, some users can't um, access. In in Solidity, everything is public, so you can hit any uh, function in the contract. The way we protect against that is saying, like, oh, if you are the owner, go ahead. If you're not the owner, we're yeah. going to stop right now. So we're going to break. Yeah. Yeah. So what we want to do is we'll make an owner. So let's say address. Um, I'm going to make everything public because everything is public. And, and uh, I think Adrian made this point last time, but the, the modifiers, the visibility modifiers on your um, functions and, but specifically for your variables, they're, they're kind of like, it's similar to Java. You're only scoping what can access them. So it's not as though they're, if I write this as private, it's not as though no one can see it or access it. It's no other contract can change it or get access to it. It's not as though it no one, it's invisible, right? It's it's not that kind of thing uh, like you would see in Java. Yeah. If, if you did want it, other contracts to access it, that would be external, right? Um, no, it's public. You don't, I don't know that you usually use external. External, external just, just means that you can't access it within the same contract. It not be accessed like from external, right? Yeah. Like either from EOA or from another contract. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm not going to answer every question because I want to get us through. Yeah, this yeah, is like easy. This, I mean, yeah. totally fine. It just might be like look that up. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> um, and then also we're going to want to make uh, this this thing that uh, we just went over today. We're going to make a mapping of what to what. Anybody have any ideas? What we want we want mul just more than one owner to be able to do things. So we want these like authorized address. huh address to an uh, address. Or what do we want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's start with that address to, and then I um, address, and then you have to do this equals. Uh, what is that? Greater than greater than. Yeah. Greater than. Fat arrow. Huh? Fat arrow. Fat arrow. Fat arrow. That's Fatter. a good one. Fat arrow. <laughs> I'm gonna make this to bool because what we're gonna say is, is this address an administrator? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this is also gonna be public. They're all gonna be public. And if I leave it off, it's public. So I just want to make everything explicit here. And then I'm gonna say. Uh, I can make it whatever, admins, whatever. I'm going to make it authorizers. And typically, this is just something with solidity. If you have a mapping, like balances, it's usually going to be the mapping is going to be plural because it's going to be a mapping of all of them. So it could be a authorizer is ch getting checked here, but to access it, we're going to say we're going to go to the mappings of authorizers. And then I want um, some events. So I'm going to make an event that I add. Well, let's do that later. Uh, we'll scaffold out what we want, and then um, and then we'll go back and like fill it out. But we'll do events too, so we can check it. So what I want here is um, I want a constructor. Uh, 
I want a modifier. Uh, I want a check uh, authorizer. I want a, sorry, an add. It would be so funny if it is O. And I just wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> want yeah, remove authorizer. Okay, so that's my scaffolding. I want to, when the contract is deployed, we're basically going to probably set owner to it. Um, and then I want a modifier to say, can this function, or is this function authorized? You know? um, and I, some might know this, I'm, and some might not. So I'm going to, tr again, try and target the middle. But modifiers basically are kind of like, if you're familiar with Python, they're going to be decorators. They're function decorators. Um, but basically, you can stick this function on the function call, and it will run through a modifier and then continue execution. So you can do things like, these are basically where you're going to do all your checks. Is the message sender equal to the owner? Mm -hmm. If yes, continue. If no, break. All right. We want to check if a uh, address is an authorizer. The reason why I'm doing this contract is this is basically kind of how you build most of your utility. You have uh, uh, some kind of saved variable. You check if that variable, like for this one, we're checking if authorizers are uh, true or false. Uh, we want to add authorizers and we want to remove authorizers. Authorizers, right? Um, so I find that I. This contract I put on all of my contracts because there. Anytime you want to do admin type functionality, you need an owner at least. But I find that the idea with the owner is it's a it's a gnosis safe, it's a multi sig, and so you know you only have one contract there. But you could also do other things where you so the multi is it confusing? <laughs> so, gnosis safe. What is that? Uh, multi sig, multi sig wallet contract. Oh, okay. So if, contract. so the owner is only going to save one address. Right, and this saves multiple addresses. But the idea with the owner is that's a that could be a multi-sig wallet where you have three. We could have this whole room sign a message to say execute, right? And that multi-sig wallet address could be the owner to this one. So you, you could get multiple people to participate and only have one contract address. And then here's another model art. Well, what if I want a couple people? So with my team, we have um, hardware wallets multiple hardware wallets, so we could have a couple, well, we also have the multi-sig too, but the idea is you could have multiple hardware wallets that can access admin functionality on this contract, um, and then if it's an owner model, it's, it's only going to be one address, so if this is just something I throw in on a lot, and you don't have to fill it out, like you don't have to put anything on here, um, but you can have it in, in case, you know, you're running, it's more, looks like more like software development where you have admin rights. Kind of thing. When when you add um, several authorizers mm -hmm. like in a multi sig, um, do you have to specify as well like two out of the three or you know nine out of ten? Right. So well, I'm going to separate multi sig wallet address or multi sig wallet with authorizers. Multi sig okay. wallet, yes. You would have two out of three, three out of five, mm -hmm. five out of seven, or one out of two, one out of one. You can make one out of one, but that's mm -hmm. just a wallet. Um, and that's a, a a smart contract. And I think you. You will make a multi-sig wallet in next week, so you'll kind of see how that works. Um, but that's just going to say how many I'm going to I'm going to make this wallet with five addresses, and then how many need to sign or uh, um, uh, signal support in order for a, a function to be able to pass or a proposition or anything like that be, be able to pass. So I could say pass in five. Um, addresses make the threshold three, mm -hmm. and then so yeah, it will check and say, did you know for this particular thing, did three people, did three addresses uh, signal yes, true. Yeah. This one is going to be, are you an authorizer? True, false. If true, keep continue to go. False, blow up. Cool. Stop execution. Okay. So that's kind of how we're going to run this. Um, so in doing so, I want an event uh, for. Um, I want an event for adding and an event for removing. Okay. Uh, so I'll do the events last because you can get a sense of that. Um, I also want errors. So I'm going to teach you, or I'm going to make. There's two styles of errors. There's a require, and then there's also functional errors. We're going to do functional errors because I've seen the industry kind of shift to functional errors, and I think they're technically cheaper. Um, gas consideration. So we'll do those last. Uh, so the constructor is, how do we do constructor? Constructor. <laughs> 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 
constructor, Runner. and I think it yells at me if I don't do public, but I, no, it's assumed, but I can't remember. Yeah, I think there's nothing on here. Okay, great. Okay, so the constructor, what ha what's the constructor? Fires once on deployment, never, ever, ever again. So I can do two things here. I want to say, basically, I've made one global uh, address, it's owner. I'm going to save the owner, that'll be like the super user. Um, this, the owner will automatically get added to authorizers, but we'll, we can, it's, we'll take a vote whether or not the owner can run um, the, the, whether an owner address will pass the modifier or it'll fail. Like maybe it needs to only be um, the authorizer. Um, and we can talk about security considerations later because there's some tricky things in here, but um, I want to get to the testing because that's the point. Um, but happy to talk about that if, if everyone feels, if we can come to a consensus on what people want to talk about. So we could do this a couple different ways, and I think I'll do it, I'll pass it in so you can see when we, uh, well, we're not going to add this to, um, you can do two things here. I can make an, an uh, input variable um, and then assign that to the owner, and this would happen, on, on, so, oh, thank you. Uh, this is actually really great when you pair a program because somebody's there like, you missed this Extra thing. Type checker. I don't have to like, well, like half an hour I misspelled, you know, I didn't put the underscore. Sam <laughs> um, We can either do this. Uh, so when, and that's kind of, when you inherit, you would pass in message sender. Mm -hmm. Or we can just say the message sender. So it only runs once. So whoever sends this, the message dot sender, and message is a attribute of address, which is a special type in uh, Ethereum. So we can say whenever this is run, which is only once, whoever sent that, whoever was the transaction origin, origin on that particular um, transaction will be saved as the owner. So we'll do that for here because this is the only thing that's happening. The modifier, how do we make a modifier? Modifier. modifier. <laughs> And we need to name it something. So I'm going to say only it, owner? huh? Only owner. So uh, this is the, this is where we're going to depart from the owner contract. Yes, okay. for the owner contract, because you would say only the owner could run this function. Okay. Here we're going to do is is this person an author? Is this address an authorizer? Is so, authorizer. So we could either say authorized is authorized. And only authorized. Only. Let's do only auth. I'm going to say only authorized. You guys can do whatever you want. It could be only authorized, which would make more sense with the um, addresses, but I'm going to do only authorized because only authorized users, it could be a contract address too, it doesn't matter. If only authorized addresses can do this. Um, how do we finish off the modifier here? I require. Oh, we need the. Cool. Here's where, okay, so we're, let's write a, I'm going to write an, an error for this. So I'm going to say, we could use, so uh, what Sam was saying was traditionally with the only owner, you would do require um, message.sender to equal, and there's only two equals in Solidity and not three, like JavaScript <coughs> does jump around there. Uh, it's still like a strict, it acts like a strict. Yeah. I wouldn't even think of it as strict, like uh, JavaScript. It's just, it's an equality is two. Okay. So there's nothing, okay. there's no okay. like, it's not as advanced as JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you can have an optional like uh, need need to be authorized. Okay, you could do this, um, and this style works a lot. It's a lot. I find it a lot faster. But um, there's this other style, um, whereas you define an error, and we're gonna say not authorized. It's similar to um, an event, and then I'm gonna throw that. With, if you're not authorized. Oh, I see. Okay, so I'm gonna say if uh, message dot. Uh, okay, so all right. Does not equal. Right. Don't we need to check the mapping to see if they are authorized? Yeah, so that's them. where we're gonna get into. That might throw everybody. But what we want it. Sh should I write this last so you can see? Because we haven't added any authorizers. Yeah, yeah let's just like add it. Yeah, add add it last. Answer. Okay. So basically, I want some. I'm gonna leave the require in there, and then I'll come back and do okay. it more uh, more fancy. Oh, get the underscore. Don't forget. Okay. That. So what is the yeah, underscore yeah, yeah. doing? What if I did this? It's only doing the requirement after the function is run. So, so we want no that. There's no point. Yeah. Not as a not as a like the uh, uh, 
a gate, like this is a gatekeeper, right? Mm -hmm. It could be the case that we want to do something at the end of our execution. Yeah. Nobody ever teaches that, but it's kind of cool. I've never used it ever, but you might want to run some like cleanup after. So what we want is uh, after this thing, we want this underscore, and what does the underscore tell us to do? Execute Everything that comes after this, right? So the first thing that happens is require message.sender to equal the owner, yes or no, and then everything else. Okay, so let's do our ch check authorizer. Maybe that'll, yeah. Okay, so how do I do a function? Function. function. <laughs> check. And then, and check, okay, let's do check. And uh, functions are typically camel case, lowercase first, so check authorizer. Sounds good to me. What do we want to make this for visibility? Probably. Uh, over the Fine. But typically we've seen a shift to making things public that are called by other parties are usually external. external. But it's pub public. External is public. It's just, it's just a, a higher qualifier to say that this is only going to be called by outside. Uh, so if we do this, then we can never check ourselves, right, within our own contracts? Yeah. Not, I I wouldn't, but I have access and to authorizers. EOA so I would just, wouldn't be able to call it, but another contract would be able to call it. Is that correct? Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's outside of this contract. Uh, so Nambar is say, uh, Nambar is saying I can't call check authorizers from within here. Within only authorized. Okay. Right. Mm. Uh, I in this contract, to... I cannot run this right. if I so, if I declare it external. So when I get to only authorize, once I. Do you need, what I need to check, check authorizer? If I'm doing it within this contract, I'm just gonna need this. Okay. Mm. I'm just gonna grab that. Okay. Okay, you, and we'll see how that works in a bit. So anyway, this should be external. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then we haven't talked too much about returns. I did see it in Adrian's slides, but uh, we're gonna return something. I was always taught, I'll get this, I'll get it. Actually, it's not in the next week's slide, but I was always taught return something. Um, so I always do, but you don't necessarily have to. But you, for this one, you want to know, you want to give the user some kind of feedback. So we want to returns, it's always plural, always, a bool. And we're going to return whether or not this um, a account is an authorizer. So uh, I skipped over this. You can either make this where the message sender is checked, or uh, it's probably a little bit more helpful if I can pass in any address. So I'm going to pass in an address here, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just call it address. You guys come up with your own naming. It could be imp, whatever. As long as it's got a little underscore, <laughs> it's not an, it's not a type. But maybe that's yeah. anybody have a better adder? Name? Huh? Adder? Let's do adder, just because it's a little different from the type. So what we're going to do is we're going to return basically is this supplied address. A, we're going to run out of time just on this contract, but <laughs> as it is. Maybe this is good. Uh, is the address I supply an authorizer or not? So does anybody have an idea how you would do that? Go for it. Uh, you go onto the authorizer's map, mm -hmm. check if authorizer, you give, you check the index of adder and authorizer, you return that. Perfect. So, so does that, everybody understand that you're indexing a hash map? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. <laughs> that, that was what that uh, hash table was, right? Yes. Yes. So, so it's going to, it's going to, in JavaScript, I don't know, I probably in JavaScript all day. It's going to access this as soon as I like write this. It's accessing, it's returning something. So it will basically go into authorizers at that index, yeah. and it will look up the Boolean there, and it will return that. So as uh, Sam said, we just want to return that, and then we're done. That's this is the thing that's done. I'm returning a boolean. It's coming from the authorizer's mapping. Yeah. So I don't have to return like. Could do this. Do you have to set it like? What if there's address isn't in the mapping at all? Is that when you do the fallback to always be false anyway? So or if it's not in there, it just will be false. Mm. Like if I'm looking at the key that the thing. Okay. So the thing that's weird about this is. I think Sam might be on this point. Um, I'm going to write div. Because, yeah, I remember that fallback one. I was, I was thinking yeah, so is, if, if the address isn't in the key, then. I think will that spit out an error or will it just yeah. assume false? Well, every every address is like a key, like a valid key. Perfect. 
And so it's just assigned default value. So like for yeah, we have to have okay. So we have to have a default value. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, for it for a boolean, it's automatically defined as like a false. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. oh, in, remember, in your head, that you get the entire key space of every address possible in this giant object. Okay. But it simulates having everything inside that key space, and then uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, everything's going to be the default value, and I'm assuming default for a boolean is going to be false. Okay. So it doesn't actually go through and load into memory this object, but it simulates that. So if you do look up in a particular index okay. inside here that was never created, it's going to simulate, simulate like, okay, that is going to be the default. Okay, so the default like, would be false. Yeah, so you don't like, have to specify it, it'll just yeah. assume. Yeah, okay. sort of like in JavaScript when you like let something and then you go use it, it will let, JavaScript will let you do that, but it's going to give you undefined as the default. Okay. And instead of giving you undefined for everything, it's going to give you a, a, a default default. Okay, so we don't yeah. need to specify. Is that right? Yeah, the only thing I would say with that is the way that we, we get around this, because you assume that the, the data structure will, will, will return anything in that mapping, because it's it gives you the entire, it says 0, 0 to FFF. FFF right. would be your top rank, right? right? So one, zero, yeah. you get access to everything. And the, the space is so large, it's right. 2 to the 256 right. places. Huge, yeah. Right. And, the reason why you get access to that is because it's a hash, it's a KCAC256 hash. Well, what, how big is that? 256 bits. More so it gives you every possible combination within that. Within that. It doesn't render it because right. it's too much space. Like, that's huge. So just not enough atoms, right? You exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does is it, is it does this like sneaky little thing where it says, if it's false, I just won't, I won't even worry about it. Okay. It's not okay, so it's only if it's true. Yeah. Am I gonna look at this? Okay. And then with these tries that we were talking about, um, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I, I said that in the in the talk. I know for the because the tries you have the the roots uh, in the in the uh, header of the block. You have the transaction receipt. You have the uh, log receipt. Those are tries. Those are the ones where you like split it up and. Right. You kind of are able to uh, determine whether or not it's in there or not. But I believe, I'm pretty sure with these too, the way the data structure is actually rendered in Ethereum in the virtual machine is if it's false, if it's a default value, it, do, it doesn't have to like extend a tree or try or anything like that because yeah. it's just, it doesn't just need to go down. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't represent that, right? Just, yeah. like, there's not it's enough resources. There. So you basically say if it's all false, I'll just have like this reference that you have this thing mapped, but if if I if they're all false, I'm not actually going to render that these mm -hmm. are all false. I'm just right. going to say, well, okay, that's as far as I got. Okay. If you have some trues in there, then it will render down to the trues, but you're not going to render down to the fifty. So you're not going to yeah. fill up that space. You can't actually because you, you wouldn't be able to pay for enough resources for that mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so here's the option. So so that's important because it will always be there for you, um, but they're assumed false. Okay. Right? Or default for Boolean would be false. Um, so there's two different ways to do this, and this is a little bit more elegant because it's a one-liner, but there's a lot of, like, there's stuff in there. So you could say, there's a Boolean, it's, it's a, you know, it's that kind of obvious. obvious. Boolean um, internal uh, local va uh, variable, um, and then get whatever is in here, return that to uh, the temp, and then just make sure, I actually wrote that wrong, but then make sure temp, you know, is whatever value, true yeah. or false. The same thing is I shouldn't make I should do this. Sorry, you increase your uh, size a little bit. On the I can always increase my size. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 I miss it. That's, 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 that's it. so uh, <laughs> let's see what is it here? Like control plus. Yeah. Um Yeah. Um Yeah. Alright. If they didn't pay the entrance fee, they can't complain about <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think Chad and I are going to work on doing this recording. I, I didn't want to record it. Uh, it's not prepared. To, like we're all crowdsourcing yeah, this because yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to go through it together so we can all kind of like get, get into the growing pains of this. Um, so I don't want. Uh, just I brought this point up earlier. It, you, typically, I, I, the way that I know it is typically your globals don't have any like underscores. Um, input uh, input parameters are going to be underscores. Uh, at the beginning, and then if you do locals, they're going to be at, at 
the end, or you can flip that around. I've also, I'm not sure, you know, you can go read the solidity, um, the style, yeah, you should read the style guide, because you should know how to put these things together. Um, it's also, every, it's all public, so when someone reads your contract, and they're like, mm, they didn't know how to, they didn't follow the style guide, you're like, mm, it looks yeah. bad, because <laughs> it's all public, right? Um, so anyway, this is the same thing, so I'm just gonna get rid of it, but basically, you know, return whether or not this address is an authorized or not. And then, so now I need to set those, right? So how would I set those? Function, add, um, add authorizer. I'm gonna make this external as well, external. Um, and then I wanna return as well, returns. Cool, these are, uh, the returns aren't, are um, anonymous um, because I don't need to, um, I'm just returning something. I could name it, and then I don't have to name that variable within the function. Does it need to return, or can it just be like void? It doesn't, doesn't need to return at all. I just always return something for feedback, um, especially if you do multi uh, multiple contract calls. You don't get anything back. So sometimes you want to make sure that uh, you get uh, feedback from a call. Otherwise, you'll drop errors, and sometimes you'll just like, it reverted. Thir 13 transactions, I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have, this is just like, you don't need any feedback whatsoever. Sam, Works. Sam, so that point is like uh, the tuple that you were mentioning in Discord returning, always returning some data is nice. You don't need it, but it's nice if you have chain contract calls. Oh my gosh. So you can bubble up errors. Bubble up, that's, that's, the, that's the key, bubble up. So hmm. <clears throat> you have to like explicitly hand, this will get more into more. Does it mean like that there's like an index for every uh, call in the call stack? And so you would have true, 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 true error, like something like that. Is that going to be in? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. It's like, what did that return when it gets popped? What did that pop, pop, pop? If, pop? if I return the void, then that actually omits an element inside that um, or data set. I'm, if I'm you thinking. don't return anything, it will just fail, and you'll get revert, 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 and then you're like, where, where revert? Or I sure. can't even check for a revert. Okay. So this is really weird. You want your fun fact for the day? Compounds contract uh, has uh, yield bearing tokens. Um, that doesn't, you don't even know what that is. But anyway, it's like uh, ERC20, which I also don't need to know because that's next week. But um, it's a token. I'm, everybody might know what a token is. Their, um, their token, when you, when you deposit into their contract, you get these C tokens back. If you transfer one of those, they have error codes so that they give you better logging why this particular transfer failed. So there are some transfers that will succeed but fail. So if you don't check that you have a successful transfer and a successful data return, you could assume that, that a transaction was made on this particular token but it's not, and that, I found that out very hard way, but um, there are these weird quirky things where like you're trying, you can take care to bubble up these errors, but if one of them doesn't return and you're trying to check like all the return values of all your calls and you don't like forward them forward, it could be the case that something fell and you're like, I have no idea what failed. Why for the uh, authorizer functions are they external? So we were talking about this, um, so external means public, and public means anybody can access. But this idea of visibility is only for, we should think of this only as what other contracts can do. Like what are the scope of this contract and, and what can other contracts or externally owned actors do? Public means accessibility. It doesn't mean any type of visibility. It's called a visibility modifier. That's <laughs> it's what is visible in this contract to other participants that are contracts or externally owned accounts. It's not whether or not I as like go to Etherscan and can see it or not, you can see everything. External, typically for functions, you're always gonna, well, typically for functions, anything that an outside actor is going to uh, execute, meaning like an EOA or another contract, you're gonna be external. Like your token transfers, uh, things that are gonna be like what a wallet would interact with your contract is going to be, sorry, uh, is typically going to be external. You can have internal, you can have private, um, and you can have nothing, which is just public. Um, but if you're doing some helper functions within uh, your contract that you don't want anyone else to be able to call, um, you can make it internal and no one will be able to get to that. Um, but what we're trying to do is make a public function that is gated. So we want anybody on the outside, like any actor, like a, a, a user, let's call them a user. So a user is gonna be somebody 
who's making a transaction against the blockchain. So a user needs to have access to this function, but we want to gate it. We only want certain users to do it. So it's still getting called externally, except we're going to say exactly, we're going to narrow down which addresses can actually run these functions. If I made it internal, only this contract could execute those. So that you'll see that in Open Zeppelin um, contracts a lot with like internal helpers, like you'll see underscore mint, you know, things like this that are the plumbing of the contract. Um, and then public, um, and you get, we didn't even talk about getters yet, but um, because this is public here, I can call owner on this contract and get the, get the result. I can also do the same thing here. Can you here. do that on externals? Uh, external functions, can you go into like user scan and call an external function? Yeah, that's when you, so uh, if we do, did I answer your question, Claude? I, can, yeah. I feel like I was stumbling on it, but uh, did we get it? Uh, yeah. It typically. I thought I was, maybe my understanding was wrong, but I thought external functions, EOS can call an external function. Okay. Okay. It's basically anything you want outside of this contract to call. And typically they're going to be user it's interactions. It's like public sans the actual contract itself. Is that kind of fair? Like, yeah. Okay. So it's like more constraint than public. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's public, the contract can call it. You always can call it outside. Well, typically it was just public, and then they kind of were, like added some context, saying like only. Ex yeah, only external entities are going to engage with this particular function. You don't usually throw external on variables because those are typically through who kind of trying to help everybody understand in your contract who's accessing this stuff. Public just, well, I don't know, it, it, I have never seen external on variables, but these ideas of um, adding more clarity in your uh, visibility modifiers were kind of, I think, just to, to help um, for functions, where are these functions getting called? More succinct, I guess. You, you can kind of think of it like a plugin for like a game or like an add-on. Like this contract is not intended to be like its own standalone thing. It's kind of like you utilize it in other contracts. So um, since this isn't like its own standalone contract and it's being run by another contract as an add-on, um, you would use it. At, you would label the functions external. I, I don't know if that kind of makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I don't know why this stuff. Did we implement add authorize other? Uh, no. uh, so yeah, uh, Adrian had an interface in his talk. If I wanted to do um, function, uh, function trans second plugin, yeah, trans transfer external external Anything. Typically, when you bring in, um, you want to bring in interfaces, and interfaces are a little complicated, but an interface is just a shape that you want to deal with uh, that you already know is implemented somewhere else. You bring these in typically um, to access these functions easier. Everything that you would bring in for an interface would be external because it's it's uh, declared in a contract, but you can use that functionality, functionality outside of that contract. Those are typically external, and you do that because you want to kind of clarify what's the scope of this function, like who's going to be interacting with it. Is it going to be just this contract or could other people? If it's other people, it's typically external. And there's peer review, there's like other things that we can put on here, but most likely things that are going to be available to users to interact with our contract, if it's a function, is going to be external. And then as Sam said, let's um, also have two spaces here. I'm going to be annoying here. Two spaces before your contract. Why? You read the style guide. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no good reason. <laughs> okay. um, I think it's just because you would have a bunch of you could put a bunch of gap in in between uh, before yeah. your contract uh, declaration. I think it has to do with that. That's my guess. Conventional. Okay. Conventional. Uh, so adding. So what are we going to add here? Like what are we going to do here? Authorizers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then of adder address. Be the address. Adder. 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 Like true. The, the thing where thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Boom, right? And then, uh, I was just trying to get to this. Uh, true. true, right? If this fails, it's gonna return false. For, I don't know why it would fail, but if it ran out of gas or something, you did something crazy. Because false is the, the default rule. 
Yeah, right? okay. Exactly. So it's going to return something. I don't need to name it. I can name this thing um, result, and then I can just say return. Because we're on 18, right? We're on 18. Uh, no, this is not a mapping. Uh, not map. Okay. There, yeah, you, we it want that to be cool. Mm -hmm. you know, but not yet. We're not there yet. But I could say res, uh, uh, result. Yeah. Whatever. Result. Does that identifier bubble up into like the end of the uh, like group? I could do this too. Same thing. Does like I don't know much about how errors are thrown in the oh. EVM, but if it were to be thrown, does it say you know reverted at? Um, some place or anything like that doesn't give you any indication where it calls that. Does it give you that name of result, or is the result completely just? So that's where we get into point? errors. Like, how yeah. can I help? So a user? Okay, so the result <laughs> itself has no like bearing on the the runtime. It's just the ergonomics for your code, right? Okay. Yeah, but you can describe errors. Yes. When things are heard. Okay. And eventually you'll get to that. So you can yeah, that's what we're doing up there, I guess. Yeah, we'll go back. Just okay. now that we have the, the structure, okay. we can go back and let, let's add our modifier and our uh, events and our errors. So I'm just going to copy paste. Let's say remove authorizer, and then it takes an address. And what do we want to do? Is that the false? So false? Nice. And we want to return true that that happened. That might be a little odd. Okay. You want to check to make sure that the address was inside of authorizers already. If you want, you want to help your users out. You want to makes completely up to you. Okay. You definitely well, could. Asking, like, like is, so like, we're gonna like require, require uh, authorizers at uh, adder, right? Should this, this should return true. If not, uh, address not an authorizer. So Toby, best practices, right? You could do this, you could uh, have that sort of check as a require, or you could do an if statement with a revert, right? Yep, yep. Um, we're going to do our, uh, I'm going to advocate that they use the function mm -hmm. uh, paradigm for errors because they're cheaper and I've seen the industry try to like, lean over to those. Function paradigm being required. Uh, no, the thing that if, if, the throw, if throw this throw function, revert. the error oh. function, yeah. And that's cheaper, right, on gas? It's cheaper. Yeah, that's what yeah. Okay. okay, you could do this. Uh, I would just say, like, I'm gonna if you if it's already false, can you get it again? <laughs> good good job. So I'm not gonna that. I'll leave it as a comment. You could do that. You, and you should do that. You could also do things, we used to do these things a lot, and you'll see these a lot, like uh, require um, Does that impact uh, address the, the yes. gas by adding the extra require? Yeah. So it would be more expensive to call that. Um, not equal address. I forget what this is, zero. A lot of these checks happen. Um, <laughs> things re really, really bad things would happen if somebody figured out the private key for address zero. But sometimes, uh, if it's if you're just like if your um, call is weird or something, and you didn't actually put in the address, so it just sent like address zero. Sometimes you want to check against that. You don't want like address zero should be nowhere in here. Um, but things would bad things would happen if somebody had the private key and could make calls from address zero. Basically, everyone would die, but anyway. <laughs> um, that's basically <laughs> where, like, thank you like for right? yeah. Name it. I mean, yeah, there's like problems everything. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. If I'm not checking address zero, like, I get the bid, you know, someone rush me. Yeah. I actually, actually did some so research for it. Only some possibles actually have a private key for that. They might oh, they might, they might, I think they might restrict it. I think they restrict it so you can't even access it either. I don't know, how would they know that, how would they know that private key wouldn't, oh, maybe whatever resolve to just can't do anything. Yeah, I think so. All right, I'm going to go back here and fill out. Now that we have this particular thing, um, I'm going to fill out. I'm going to fill out. Let's do the errors because then I'll go back and hit this modifier. So I made this error. So this is the nomenclature for writing functional errors. You have the declaration of error. Uh, the same thing will happen with event. So this is an error, and then it's uppercase camel case, uh, which will be uh, a function that gets called. So I'm going to write this because, as Cloud said, this is like a cheaper version, like it's cheaper in gas execution, than doing require. And just so you know, all of these strings that you put in your errors cost storage. So you, so you have this 24 kilobyte size limit on storage for mainnet. L2s, you, it's different. But for mainnet, your contract size can only be so big. All of these strings cost you storage. So, whether, but they're helpful because, as Sam said, if I get a revert, 
is it going to tell me what? Well, this one would say need to be authorized if that reverted, right? But if I didn't put anything here, it would say no. I it just it just stopped working. So you, you can go guess why. Um, this is one style. The other style is as Chad said, if what are we doing? Message dot sender uh, not equal to authorizers at. Uh, message. This is what Adrian did and his little thing. Um, if that's not the case, if it's not the case that the person calling returns true when I put that address wouldn't, in to authorize. Wait, wouldn't it actually just be authorizers if no. not the access of that? There's no trip. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Could do yeah. that too, right? Oh, it's, so if you so Okay. So if you're true. Mm -hmm. I see. This is false. So if you're false to true, um, if you're, uh, so if, yeah, because I'm throwing an error here. I'm gonna. This is gonna be. So this is gonna blow up. True. So you okay. can do whatever you want. Um, oh yeah. This is kind of like more explicit. You can do however you want to do it. You're gonna throw, uh, throw new. This is kind of more like a JavaScript style. Throw. Oh, sorry. Throw this right here. New not authorized. And so. In the calls, uh, in like if you look up at Etherscan, it will say error, like revert, not authorized. Let's throw them. So you can name your functions to be descriptive so that you don't have to put these um, strings in there to say what happened. I think that's kind of why it saves gas, is you're like descriptively, you're trying to like optimize yeah. what the um, uh, what the information is, and you're doing that by throwing a descriptive function. So we're just going to say, if this message sender, uh, when I look it up, if it's not true, um, how do we want to say? Is that better? Am I saying that right? So you could do. So this would be true. Um, if you can either do not, not. You can either do a not in here, like we had yeah. it, or whatever you want. Like to that say. would be weird because I, I don't think that would work because message dot sender is an address type, and authorize the return of authorizers of the message sender is a boolean. So you're comparing an address to. Oh, boolean. sorry, sorry, sorry. I think we do have to do uh, No, well, this is a equality. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's just do, yeah. Yeah. if yeah. you're not in there, if, if that returns false, then this will be flipped true, and then we'll engage this mm -hmm. conditional branch, and then we'll throw an error, right? That makes sense. Um, thank you, thank you. This is going to be team effort going all the way up. Um, so that's our error, right? So that's one style. One style is this require. The other style is this like if thing. And then let's make events. Events are uh, going to be. See, I don't. Why am I not putting that error? That's weird. Event is going to be um, uh, add whatever authorizer added. Whatever you can make these. These are going to be just like Adrian had said. What do you? Oh my god. Of course I can't spell when I'm typing. Authorizer. <laughs> You can make these whatever you want. You don't have to be anything. Um, and then as we learn with Adrian, you can put stuff in here. You get access to three that are indexed. I'm not going to go into those, but I'm going to say like we could, we can emit information like who we added. Let's just say who we added and who added it. So I'm going to do address, um, uh, and let's just write indexed. You guys can figure out what that means later. Address index um, sender, because that would be the message sender and address index. Index or no, uh, address index um, new admin or new authorizer, whatever it matter. These these are less important. Um, no, this is how you would access it in like testing. So these are important. Yeah, we want to keep these. So this is gonna fire uh, never because we didn't put it in here. So let's go put it in. So uh, authorizer. So I've got two addresses in here. One is the person who's author like the the authorizer and then the new person that's authorized. So let's go to add. And here's like what I was saying. Like, do you want to emit your event before or after you change state? Emit this thing. I'm going to say message sender and adder. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. All right. So basically, state is changed, and then I eject this event, right? And this isn't. This is atomic. Like this is all just going to be some like a whole bunch of execution that happens, and it's going to be in a block. It's like very static. Like everything changes, and then we go to a new block. Everything changes, we go to a new block. It's not it's not dynamic. It's like I don't one thing happens, another thing happens. It's more how you're like stepping through your execution. Same thing for 
Um, events for remove. Uh, let's see, remove, same exact format. Um, I'm just going to copy that. Of course, uh, or just keep in mind, you have to throw this init thing, mm -hmm. right? Emit, same thing. This is going to be message, message sender, and we're going to do this adder. Um, the only thing I would do is a new event, just like declaratively set up a new authorizer, just say old authorizer. Uh, oh, good call. Good call. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, more descriptive. Everybody good? I if we're not, if this isn't it, it's pretty close to this. Okay. I like trying to throw it in front of y'all. Is it is it usually better to have the change of state before the event to avoid reentry fee? It depends. No one's going to reenter this contract because it doesn't leave this contract. Mm -hmm. Reentry fee is always going to happen when you go out somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so it's complicated. It would be a situational thing, but you just have to think about that. Do I want to throw an event before I leave this contract, or do I want to get the information from another contract and then continue execution and say that happened. Uh, you can throw like these modifiers, you can make a, a, a reinterest guard to stop that kind of thing, but you know, it, it's kind of like what in your head, or, or when you want to see in the call step, like when you want to see in this, uh, the transaction execution, like what happened, do you want to see an event happen before something happened, or do you want to see an event after execution happened? So it might be situational. Um, typically, I, I think I actually throw these before, but I don't know. I mean, it will it will make a difference, but it's probably very rarely where it will make a big difference because these are this is like two lines. Of it's not nothing huge is happening oh. here. Okay, so now I'm going to make sure that uh, these compile. So just if you're playing along, the the double uh, folded paper is your access to your files, and then you go down to um, oh, so you can load up things. Um, in the plugins, hopefully it, j I don't know how it default um, starts for y'all, but you can look things up, and then you got this thing right here, which is gonna be where you do your um, compilation. Um, so I've, I'm gonna select, what did we do, 18? Um, so this says less than or equal to 18, so I can do anything under this, so maybe that's terrible, but let's lock it to 18. It'll lock it to 18. It has to be 18 now. Uh, and I'm gonna go switch compiler 18, and then I can hit compile, and it's gonna tell me, look, oh, so helpful. This is what happened in VS Code too. Like, this is just I'm giving you another. Should be error. Uh, say again. Yes. Yes. I'm not getting this. Twenty-six. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yay! It broke. <laughs> what happened? Uh, throw new. I think new is the wrong thing. I think it's supposed to be error. I'm oh, sorry. That. I think I'm getting that in. This is throw. No. Oh, I think. What is it? Throw, throw new error. Oh, is it throw new error? I think it's throw error is what new I'm getting. Like, plug in? Error. No. Maybe it's that new compiler. Does anybody know this site? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not getting any like linting issues in VS Code from the Solidity mm -hmm. extension mm -hmm. when okay. I do error. But I am error. getting uh, expected. expected identifier. I'm just yeah, not I was sure. getting that weird thing for a while. I thought that was, I thought that was something mm -hmm. else. Uh, well, this is good. See, like when we do these live coding things. Um, Did you try to throw it? Oh, maybe there's no error. Okay. Author, what is this saying? 26, expected semicolon. Do you need a bracket for your if? I, I just tried it. It didn't do it. It's very strange. Throw it. Error throwing? Yeah, I was going to look at it. <laughs> It was chat GPT. Come on. Come on, chat GPT. I did cheat too. Let me cheat. I'll cheat. Oh, sorry. It's reverse. Is it? Uh, oh, reverse. Okay. All right. Of course it is, right? Yeah, it has to be. You have to revert this error. Okay, that's good. Good compiler. You did good. Okay. So, sorry about that. Uh, you need to throw the, like, you're reverting there, and that will. Stop execution, revert the state back to what it was before the transaction. It basically all that execution explodes. All right. uh, then we get some happy, like we get some uh, warnings here. Uh, you can restrict the function state to view on 31. That's here. We're not changing anything, so this could be view. <laughs> we all have errors. <laughs> okay, I'm done. If, if there's not, let's get everybody fixed before we move forward, because you're going to copy and paste this. So. Oh, 
I was missing a semi-song. Nope, now it's something else. <laughs> We're going to go to heart and hat next. Once everyone can make sure we can get through everything. Oh, it looks like they do want you to add public to the functions. Yeah. Public to the functions? Yeah, add authorizer, remove authorizer, something like that. Uh, are you on compiler 18? Yeah. Uh, I don't have it on that. Do you have it at 26? I can see it like all the short part starts here. Not all that, right? We're not using the modifier in this case right now, right? Which one's no. the modifier? So the modifier is going to be something that you put on like another contract. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, um, that's not what we're going to do, right? Like, because right now they um, didn't add an option. Right? Because that's just yeah, the, it's not much the convention. All right, we got our first code audit. <laughs> What's wrong with this? <laughs> What's wrong with this information? What's wrong with these two? I mean, he said it, but what's wrong with this? Okay. Who can call this? Anyone. Anybody can call. <laughs> Check uh, all the things. <laughs> That's a good point. All right. Yeah. Or you don't have, like, it doesn't. Uh, and it's okay that check authorizers are still external, right? Because we're calling it within our contract. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't want to do that, actually. So I think that's what you were making. That yeah. Really, yeah, I could call. Uh, I also don't want to pass anything. Does everybody fix their errors? Oh, no. We can fix it. Let's Nine. fix the errors and I'm going to go. All right. Do this better. Uh, Sam's in VS Code. Are you still on errors? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I copied over to code oh, and then it was remixed. But I'm getting uh, function relevant source part starts here in the check author. Make sure you have the right compiler. I'm on 18. Commit. Yeah, I'm all the same. If we're not all getting errors, we're not doing it right. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Y'all, this is a very simple contract. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how many times I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's why. Because I don't think yeah. you're a developer who just builds something. Yeah. So like when you're on YouTube and you're watching people build something, 99.9% .9 of the time they have a second screen up. Yeah. Having it be built. Also a lot of dev rails, mm -hmm. right? If you ever go look at the GitHub, look at who, right? They'll be like, oh, look at GitHub. Look who contributed, push the commits. And it's usually not the dev bro who's explaining it to you, right? Yeah. It's the developer that built it, and he's copying from that GitHub and explaining it to you. <laughs> right, so. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, check authorizer is fine to be external because that's going to be called externally. It's modifier that would not want to be external. And that's the one that we're going to use. Sorry, yeah. I was calling yeah. the wrong one. Only authorize is what we're going to stick on these things here. Add authorizer. Yeah, and remove. And, and remove, yeah. Because we don't want anyone doing that, right? Now it's Do we keep them as external? Yeah. Yes, only but the only authorize is going to be a modifier that can be called internally. But add authorizer is going to be a function that can be called outside of this case. Does it require a invocation of only authorizer? It does not. However, if you did want to pass things to it, mm -hmm. you would need to do that with, like, if I made okay. this to take If I leave it as empty, will it still work? Uh, it, should, it should still work empty. Okay. But it should work without them as well, if you, if you don't have any parameters. Yeah. Did we get kind of stall? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, yeah, yes. modifiers can either be invoked with the function without it, so like only on they're like very yeah special type of. I think most people just call them. Warning. Without function state mutability can be restricted in view. Are you getting that? That's a warning. You, that's fine. Oh, so, that's a warning. I'm good. Then. Yeah. Okay. You can put view on there. It's that one is check authorizer. It's saying you didn't change the state here, so you can actually make that a free. If you don't put view on your functions, uh, now they're external. They're public. Yeah. Uh, it's just like extra clarity. That it doesn't change state. Oh, Add authorizer changes state, and remove authorizer changes state. If you put, okay, you actually do. You have to put view on these to make them free. Otherwise, they cost money. Does it matter that we're external view? Good question. Uh, that's the only ones. I would say, you know, I always put a waiver. Like, I always put external view, but you, you can dig into the docs. I, like I said, we're on our we're on our own adventure here. Yeah, fixes it. Okay. Yeah. Got we all good? Good? Good. Everybody so who wants to be good is good. If you, if you don't put view, it will so cost check it out. I'm going to take view off as check authorizer. <laughs> yeah, I did. We were having yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. It's going to say warning to do that, but when I deployed it, 
So I'm going down to this. Now this is where you would deploy it. If you see up here, I can deploy it to many different chains. If I wanted to actually connect MedMask to it and deploy to like Gorily or what are the other one? Spolia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or even you know mainnet or whatever. I could I could hit MetaMask, target that chain, and then I could actually make transactions. Um, VM uh, is that's local uh, for London, the London build, and then also the Berlin. It depends. I London is by address basically. Does it not say like injected web three. It's you got like option. Uh, injected provider, yeah. Injected provider. You can also hook this up to hard hat. I mean, it's that's pretty cool. Though. That's just like cool. I said, that's like Remix, is, they've been working on it for a while. You can do your unit testing in here as well. I don't, but you can. Um, anyway, so I'm going to deploy this locally. And when I hit deploy, it's going to make a transaction, and there's no mining time or anything because this is a local thing. But if you uh, authorize it, what did I just, what was this, check? Okay, gives it to me for free anyway. Yeah, I can do this for free. Um, so it used to be the case. I think maybe that's the compiler. Um, it's assuming that this is a free thing. Uh, okay. it, will, if, it will be... So it's, it's going to complain at you that you're not being explicit, but it will... And so up being a view function. No. Is that understandable? Yeah, well, aren't the view functions the blue ones? Yeah, that's true. This, this that right. function oh, okay. costs. Yeah, it does cost. It does cost. I'm thinking of it's not payable, so it doesn't show up in red here. If it was payable, it would show up Got as it. red and say that you actually have to you actually have to provide. Oh, value. Gotcha. But this is let's do it again. So and this color coding blue. is red means you have to pay to it. That's just for this. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> for this paradigm. But you yeah. see it when you click that for function, remit. it'll ask you. It'll have two parameters there. It'll say there we you know, go. Okay. Explicitly, say, this is true. Look at how we're learning. I love it. Uh, and I, you know, all this stuff is in my head for a little while, then I have to do something else and I forget it. So this is where uh, it's not um, declared view. It would cost gas. Yeah. This is declared view. It's free. It's basically just like a database lookup. Like, yeah. go, go look this thing up. Give me that. Get. If, if I was doing it, it's a getter. Instead of that. Not technically a getter, but it is yeah. the same kind of a concept. And if, if I click this one here, it would cost, it would cost me gas. So it's saying you should make this view because you don't change state. You want to do that because inter anyone interact, you don't want to make people have to pay to check. It's off, like right? Right? the R in CRUD, whereas the L is the U in CRUD. Oh, the read up the D. <laughs> the D. Uh, yeah. As well as the D. And the C. All the other ones. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. So if you're doing all of those, yeah. You yeah. Know, you're going to be, that's going to cost, right? I'm only just saying, like, there's a lot of parallels between all these different concepts in different, like, environments. CRUD being more like, API design in like server world, not I mean, that yeah, solidity. Solidities. But they're all kind of like the same concepts. You have you either you're reading something or you're writing something, and then we just reinvent the wording around it all the time. Right, uh, rest. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> right, it's right in the middle of solidity, yeah. right? So you can either write to yeah. the EVM to get the state back, or you can read from it. So exactly. But solidity you know, essentially is just an API. It's it is just a back end. At, at the most abstract layer, like layer, all programming is is moving data from one place to another. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're making Web3 applications, unless you specifically need a database or some type of backend, Solidity can't be that, right? And that's what you'll be interacting with, storing, writing to. But there are there are times where smart contracts still need to, to talk to both a database that would be like Web2 and a front end. Mm -hmm. so. so it's 156. We're slotted till 2. So I think I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm. if anyone wants to continue next week, I was going to speed run all the modules uh, so you guys can get a feel for like how these things work. I mean, it's not going to be fast enough for you to copy all of the answers. Um, I can still do that. Or if everybody wants, we can just do this again with hard hat. So I'll let you, you guys can maybe vote uh, and do whatever you want. Um, what we would want to do is test everything here. So you would make a test for owner. You would make a test for authorizer added. You would make a test for remove. And what Sam and, uh, I don't know if Adrian, I, one of you in the talk okay. said, you want to do a positive test and a negative test. Yeah, yeah. You want a success and a failure. Yeah. So you would say, I expect owner to be whoever deployed. And the, the fun thing about Foundry is like you don't get access to the address. Uh, space that you do in hard hat. So it's kind of fun to see the difference. But anyway, I want to test that when I add an event, authorizer adder, authorizer added is a, a negative. And I want to test that 
it fails if like something you know fails. Uh, I want to make sure that authorized remove is emitted. I want to make sure that when an error is thrown for not authorized, I get not authorized. I want to make sure you know again the owner was the message deployer or the the owner is the deployer of the contract. And then I want to check. I want to check a function called uh, you can't check the the uh, modifier itself, but you want to check check authorizer. You want to check or you want to test add authorizer. You want to test remove authorizer. And then with with Foundry as Chad had said, you could do fuzzing where you just throw a whole bunch of GAC at it and see what happens, make sure. But with these, it's like, I've typed it to an address. If I put something in that doesn't isn't a, a, uh, an Ethereum address, it, the, the machine won't allow you to do it anyway. So, uh, but fuzzing is kind of helpful when you're doing like a lot, like a bigger contract, right? This one's very tightly scoped. Um, but they're, they, they're handled differently in Hard Hat than they are in Foundry. And that's kind of what I wanted to explore. So we can either continue this next week if you all want, or um, the next week is like lots of solidity. Like basically the whole idea is practicing solidity so that you're making you do tons of modules of solidity. Week five, Which, this one? Six. six. Oh, sorry. So five, five is, uh, yeah. what are we doing? Five. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, advanced maps. data structures, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so six is going to be like basically like practice week. Wait, mm -hmm. that's mine? Yeah, next yeah. week. So right. next week, what I was going to do in the after, um, sorry, bad thing, I'm gonna get no, sorry, sorry. Uh, after mm -hmm. the, the talk was like run through a lot of these modules. But it's basically like doing this kind of thing, but fast. Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna do this for this one. We do this for this one, or we can continue this. So you guys can make it up. I'll I'll be presenting next week on. Um, uh, it's like inheritance. I think you get the multi-sig contract in that. Um, I can't remember. I was doing seven, which is governance, but um, it's just like a lot of solidity practice. So you're gonna be doing lots of contracts. Yeah, and that's why I was saying it was like a good idea to, because we're going through like testing all these things. I think it was a really good thing that you did, where you went into the uh, the kind of testing library yeah, to I see sure. what mm -hmm. possible types of tests you can do. Because yeah. that was a thing for me. I'm like, how do I even mm -hmm. test this stuff? It's that's like, one of my biggest gripes with Mocha and Chai is they were invented or written at a time before pre TypeScript was invented. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was like the the fad of JavaScript was make this very DSL-y, I don't know if you know that term, but like, make it like you're writing out words. Yeah, in language, extremely. Right? Yeah. And so like that fact that you're doing expect this to be that blah, 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 yeah. it, it seems like it would help in readability, but it's really, like uh, programmatic. It, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a dear, for me at least, to know how to write the thing because there's just so much API. And so I like a smaller API set where it's like, I already know how to check for equality. I do this equals that. So I like assertion libraries that are more akin to that. So that's some one of my gripes with expect or chai and the, that assertion library. So at least with types, you can kind of peer into what shit did they add to it and um, figure it out from there. But even then it's still hard. Like I still don't know how, there's like check balance was the one I wanted to do. Uh, and I didn't know how to like get the you know, get the balance was one thing, but that was a whole. Just other. an FYI, if you're ever dealing with the native currency like ETH and you're trying to check balance, it's very difficult to do because you have transaction fees. So you have to take into account how much uh -oh. you spent on a transaction in order to get the equality. Mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. you'll see in the um, in the in the material they get around that a little bit, um, but uh, it's easier to do with token transfers. Token transfer, you're like, uh, I'm not paying attention to gas. So, um, but you can use, it's just something, if you're using native currency, it, you can get into a, a problem where you're like always chasing down different balances because there's transaction costs. However, in this material, you will have to do that, but they, they don't, they, they basically say, um, they check the balance before something happened. And, and I think that's six though. I, yeah. I'm so, getting similar to that, that, if you look at Uniswap v2, um, like with table functions, when you're adjusting uh, these <coughs> sort of like uh, uh, pairs, like you have to subtract the value that you're adding to a payable function from the balance to adjust the, the current balance. Um, so whenever you have like a payable method, right, you're passing in some value, yeah. you have to like take that into account I see. Um, and update your state or check after you subtract. Interesting. At the end of the day, a lot of this is just developer friendly APIs that I feel like could be, is a little lacking, but you just gotta learn, work around yeah. them. Maybe, hey, invent a new one and then throw yeah. it up in uh, you know, be a web developer, <laughs> be a front end developer and just invent a new library and then that would be a, 
that would be interesting. So before we yeah. break out, guys, I just have a question. Please don't be shy. We've kind of had two separate forms of teaching. So just by a show of hands, did you guys prefer having workshops today or a usual breakout where everybody's kind of solo and we go around? So I personally you like prefer it. today. Can you just raise your hand? That's all. I, I personally like this last one. Yeah. Um, it's very information dense though. So like, yeah. I feel like I cannot touch my computer again for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably a good thing. For my <laughs> but you guys kind of prefer the workshops and then going home and working more so than being here and then we're working through the modules. Is what I'm understanding. Okay. Yeah. Because like even for me, like I, I think most of the modules like they're very explan explanatory. So like you kind of they kind of teach you the concepts. Yeah. But it's good to have like practical experience because as soon as I jump into ID. It's kind of like, oh shit, it's a little different now, rather than being taught something through the modules. So at least for me, personally, I feel like it's really nice that the fact that we went through this, because I feel like it really solidified some of my solidity yeah. understanding. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it, like <laughs> fun, fun this side, I really do feel like I had like a general grasp, but going through this, us talking together, yeah. filling in the gaps of our understanding, for me, I feel like I learned a lot. And it just also like talking, yeah. makes it apparent knowing what you don't know, so that way I can like, I want to go look this up later or break away with a side, you know, sidebar with one of the mentors on something. Yeah. Or even if I'm struggling on something, I know to like go on, you know, Discord and say, hey, when we were going through this, I didn't keep up and I want to like know what, what was up. And so it could be, so having like a little mini workshop on some of the concepts for that week is preferable for you guys to learn than having you guys break out and work through the modules and ask questions. I personally, yeah. Okay. Also yeah. leverages that we're all here, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, I was gonna say like we all together. You saw how many mistakes I made, and I. Uh, just wrote this up I think just last week I was making a new contract and I wanted to write an authorizer I was going through it by hand to rewrite it to test in for uh, foundry so I, had, I already wrote this it's, it's fresh in my mind and I still made all these mistakes mm -hmm. with it. but we all together over the past hour made 61 lines of solidity code that Woo! I think is you, you could use this on and I won't get into this I was hoping to get to testing so we could test this but you could use this in production on anything to control like your administrative permissions on all your functions. Well, you know, to the degree that you need. Not to rug people, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but I would not recommend rugging anybody. <laughs> However, if you wanted to gate functions, um, for instance, for when we get to like um, proxy contracts, when you want to switch your implementation, you don't want anyone, and that, I dumped that into week seven. You don't want anyone to be able to switch where that proxy is pointing to. <laughs> Yeah, it, that's when you could rug a lot of people. But uh, yeah. do you prefer writing your own like authorization contracts or just using like Open Zeppelin's uh, like? I would uh, always recommend pressure. using something that has been highly <laughs> scrutinized, tested. Lots of money and eyeballs have been on their stuff. I find that uh, there's a uh, I quickly run into issues with like you, like basically like take any module from Open Zeppelin, and they're trying to do a more modular approach now where you can like grab things, take that and extend it. Do, does everyone know what Open Zeppelin is here? Uh, yeah. No? Everyone Let's also referencing Ethernauts, which is the so well, amazing. Real quick, just because I saw some heads that shook now, but yeah, Open Zeppelin is kind of like a uh, best practices library that you can just ingest into your contracts, and they have things like authorizers, they call it only owner, for example. So um, that's the one where I'm like, that's what they throw on everything. Mm -hmm. I want more, I might want more. So where's more functionality. It just depends on what you want. Functionality, which you want. But they're great. I mean, this is a really great company too. They're in um, Argentina, which is like, huh. why are there so many like, brilliant devs in Argentina? I don't know why, but they've been so you can killing it for like a long time. You can import these things at the top of your Solidity files. So if you wanted to make yeah. something like an NFT, right? <laughs> As you see here, you can import this, which points at a library, like GitHub, and then you can just say, is that, and then now you have a standard ERC721. Right? So you don't have to have any of the potential downfalls. And if he actually opens up, let me scroll down. Did you go to the GitHub? Or, no, no, on the sidebar. Okay. Can you see, is it there? Uh, open Zeppelin actually has, oh, can you type in Open Zeppelin uh, contract maker? Oh, they have a wizard. Yeah, the wizard. Uh, contract wizard. Uh, wizard. Right there, right there. Oh, Second one. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. 
So this wizard, right, you can even come in and you can build all of these type of contracts, governance, custom, uh, 1155, 721, and 20. Um, and then you can choose what you want it to be. Do you want it to be principal or right? And it's gonna use it's gonna use all of the Oakland Zeppelin. Oh, it's got upgrade ability now in there? Yeah. Um, Careful with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> if you don't know what these things mean, you will quickly shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. yeah. Only use what you know. But this is great because yeah. this stuff, like, yeah, super fun. You are using Open Zeppelin's um, implementations. So there's a standard and then there's an implementation. Standard is a, basically like a, similar to an interface. It's like what should this thing look like? And then the implementation is how does it function? So Open Zeppelin takes some of these standards, ERC20, 721, 1155, and they implement them. But they are widely accepted in the industry as very secure, well-implemented contract standard implementations. So a lot of people will just turn them in and yeah. Or just import, really. Oh, it's, you're, yeah. Copy and pasting is bad. <laughs> in Solidity, I mean, copy and pasting is dangerous. You you want to import and yeah. then you know um, uh, you know uh, invoke basically. So it looks good. prettier too on when you go to verify if you do imports uh, instead of your contract being like this. It'll modularize each import and like show it that way. So would you not want to copy and paste because it could just mess up your whole contract itself? So you're in like a very very security conscious like clean space um you especially with libraries you don't really like when you i don't know if what what platforms you're on but for like npm or something i don't copy the library and paste it in i like pull it into a package manager because i don't want to be copying and pasting anything I want it to blow up when I forgot a bracket or something like that. There's too much room for a human error. Yeah. yeah, and you just never know when that's going to... Unless uh, you're really good at copy and pasting. <laughs> which, like, <laughs> I have not made it good. I, 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 I will <laughs> say... Uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. Uh, there was a lot of problems in the past where people were having, like, rats, like, or, uh, like, like, basically viruses on the computers, where if you copy an address, when you pasted it, it would be their, 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 their the virus owner's address. So that's where sometimes copying and pasting can be a problem. Because sometimes you can have a sleeper virus on your computer and you don't even know it. And then like they can swap out addresses or change your pasted code to something else. Like they could be near your screen that changes something. So it's so much better just to like not have that as like a barrier for like kind of something it, happening just in case. You know? Yeah, like if you're copying and pasting without reading, that's really bad. Yeah, yeah. So that's the point. Is that you're probably the programmers are lazy. So if you copy and paste something and then you're just like, all right, I'm done. Or you look at it a little bit and you think you did it, your due diligence, there's something yeah. a lot better. There's always right 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Right. Oh, one second. Oh, we want to give you. So we want to give you some. Open Zeppelin is, is great for standardization, but sometimes it's not that fast optimized. So I want to point you to one other sort of uh, standard library by a gas optimizer. Um, this guy you should, is you should follow him on Twitter, by the way. Good gas Soulmate. Uh, Soulmate. Uh, but Soulmate is a bunch of sort of. Uh, Libraries implemented from Open Zeppelin in the most gas optimized way. So, um, nice. for those gas golfers out there, or soon to be gas golfers, check out Soulmate and then follow Transmissions 11 uh, if you want some gas golfing tips. Are there any package managers yet for Solidity? Like NPM for package for Solidity, where you just like, I don't know, Soul can install this and then it grabs from the repository Soulmate or whatever. So no. you can do that with you do it hard hat. You can do it with Foundry. And, well, Foundry has yeah. their modules you can pull in, but I think Hard Hat also has modules from like. You know, hard Hat has Hard Hat tools, but it's not like. Okay. So if oh. you throw in at Open Zeppelin, a lot of them like Remix will pull them in. Okay. So it, that's kind of like it, but they're like yeah, more like, like automatic imports. Yeah, it's all kind of like wired together. Versus like here is a tool that has been kind of standardized to connect to this repository, this registry, to grab the things, versus we kind of have to like yeah. go and keep them. Interesting, maybe that'll be a problem. I mean, to um, answer Oscar's point, like uh, in the Sam, older look up days, cook -book you would uh, copy cook and paste open Zeppelin. <laughs> They're looking to build and then a package like, manager and for like Solidity. Okay. Although it's not, I don't think they have an SDK yeah. yet. So if you look at them, you not they've that, got, you can search, you no other search for you can contracts, but I don't know yeah. if there's an SDK where you can pull this. Something that's always interesting to me is like,